Hi everyone and welcome to another video on how to answer the most common pages or phone calls. Today we will learn how to manage patients with high blood pressure. So let's get started. So let's say a nurse calls you to report an elevated blood pressure, whatever that blood pressure may be. As you can imagine, there are multiple scenarios the high blood pressure phone call or page can present itself. So depending on how high your patient's BP is, you will act accordingly, which we will discuss in a bit. But things to consider asking before all when a nurse calls you to report a high blood pressure are the following. First question is obvious, just ask for a specific blood pressure and heart rate. The blood pressure and heart rate value obviously will tailor your therapy further as we will see in the upcoming slides. Then uh, you have to ask, did you recheck the blood pressure twice on both arms? And by asking this, not only you're trying to confirm an elevated blood pressure, but also you want to rule out a life-threatening condition like aortic dissection, for example, which you'll get to in a bit. Then you have to ask, did you try changing the blood pressure cuff? Sometimes it so happens that some patients need smaller or bigger cuff size to measure an accurate blood pressure. So you have to ask, is the patient is agitated or is he in pain? Because this can also elevate the blood pressure. Ask if the patient is in alcohol withdrawal, which also is a very common reason for elevated blood pressure and heart rate in, in hospital settings. Then you have to ask them if the patient has any psychiatric disturbances like hallucinations or dementia related confusion called sundowning, uh, which can also be a cause of elevated blood pressure. Another very important thing to consider is asking if the patient is under permissive hypertension. As you know, we allow permissive hypertension, which is BP less than 220 over 120 in the first 24 hours after a patient is diagnosed with ischemic stroke, which ischemic stroke was already outside of the TPA window. All right, so this is another thing to consider. If all of the before mentioned causes have been ruled out, then there are two scenarios this phone call can go. One is where the nurse reports BP less than 180 over 120, in which case you don't really need to rush to the bedside of the patient. Instead, you want to review the chart first because this patient does not need immediate help right now. What you're looking in the chart is again the primary diagnosis of the hospital admission. That's pretty obvious. Then you want to see if this hypertension is old or new. You're gonna see the blood pressures in the previous days and how the trend is. If this blood pressure, if this high blood pressure is old and the patient is already on treatment, then you have to check if the patient received his daily scheduled medications or he did not receive his daily BP meds, like his NPO for a procedure the next day, or because he is nauseous and he cannot keep the, any oral medications down, or he cannot swallow pills for whatever reason, stuff like that. If the hypertension is old, then you have to see if his home BP meds were restarted or not. On many occasions, it so happens that patients present to the ED and are hospitalized with low blood pressure. In that case, the admitting team will not restart their home BP meds in order not to further worsen the already low blood pressure. So check the chart if they have any blood pressure medications, home BP meds that were not restarted and you can restart those. If the home BP meds were restarted, then check if you can increase the doses of this uh, already existing in the chart BP meds. And if the patient is not on any blood pressure medications and the, pa the patient again is not agitated, not anxious, not in pain, you have ruled out all other causes of elevated blood pressure, then you might need to start them on some antihypertensive therapy, which we will discuss in the upcoming slides. On the other hand, if the nurse reports a blood pressure of more than 180 over 120, then you need to be slightly more worried and basically you need to quickly go to the patient's bedside. At bedside, you need to ask for BP measurements in both arms, if you haven't done already that, to rule out again what? 
the aortic dissection, right? So how you're gonna rule in this section is by noticing variation in the pulse, like absence of proximal extremity or carotid pulses, and blood pressure difference of more than 20 between the right and the left arm. Obviously, apart from these measurements, you will see that the patient is uh, experiencing, for example, abrupt onset thoracic or abdominal pain, which is sharp, tearing, and repeat character. So these are all things that will help you, guide you further. Once you have ruled out the aortic dissection, which can quickly kill your patient, that's why you want to rule it out first, then you need to check for any end organ damage based on physical exam, labs, imaging studies, which we'll discuss in a minute. Also, always, always, always know when to call your senior resident if you're not the senior resident. Remember, in life-threatening situations, if so happens that you are not sure what to do next, always call for help, being your senior resident or your attending. Don't be a hero. We are dealing with people's lives. It's okay not to know, but it's not okay not to call for help when you don't know what you're doing. Now, in case the BP is more than 180 over 120, we again can have two different scenarios. One is where the patient is asymptomatic, called hypertensive urgency, and the other where the patient is symptomatic, called hypertensive emergency. Let's review the hypertensive urgency first. So when you have a patient who is relatively or completely asymptomatic, they might have like a mild headache with a blood pressure in the severe range, which is more than 180 over 120, then this patient who doesn't have any acute end organ damage, then this patient with this blood pressure and no acute end organ damage has hypertensive urgency. Treatment options for these patients are preferably oral medications, like clonidine, for example. Clonidine is not used for long-term therapy and clonidine is, as you remember, alpha-2 adrenergic agonist. And it reduces the sympathetic outflow from the CNS and decreases the peripheral resistance, the renovascular resistance, the heart rate and the blood pressure. Side effects to watch for are sedation, dry mouth, bradycardia or prostatic hypotension and eventually impotence, which you will not see with one dose of clonidine. Another option is captopril oral again medication. Please don't use it in volume overloaded patients. And an IV medication that you can use in hypertensive urgency is hydralazine. Please do not give it in tachycardic patients. Now, in patients with hypertensive urgency, your blood pressure goal should be less than 160 over 100. However, the mean arterial pressure should not be lowered by more than 25 to 30% over the first two to four hours. This is super important to remember. Please, please remember this because if you lower it with more than 25 to 30% the mean arterial pressure in the first two to four hours, then this rapid BP drop can cause disturbance in the auto regulation mechanisms of the body to keep adequate tissue perfusion and you can cause ischemic stroke, myocardial infarction or even blindness in your patient. So this is super important detail to remember. On the other hand, when you have a symptomatic patient with a blood pressure in the severe range more than 180 over 120, with symptoms like headache, blurry vision, chest pain, shortness of breath, decreased urinary output, confusion, then this condition is called hypertensive emergency. In these cases, not only you have to manage the blood pressure, but you also need to do further workup to look for end organ damage, as we mentioned a couple of slides back. Now again, in hypertensive emergency, like in the hypertensive urgency case, you have to rule out life-threatening conditions, which was the aortic dissection. So please, I cannot stress this enough, always, always measure the BP on both arms. You can also consider checking the D-dimer. Why? Because you know, when you have high blood pressure, the blood vessel gets hurt from the shearing forces. And then when the blood vessel has been hurt, a clot can form. Now, when this clot starts getting broken down, you will see elevated D-dimer in the blood. 
Other tests to do are troponin, BNP and EKG to look for new ST changes indicating MI. Then you have to order chest x-ray to rule out flash pulmonary edema or mediastinum widening for dissection again. You have to order CT head to rule out brain bleed. You have to order BNP to check for increased BUN creatinine. Order also urinalysis to look for proteinuria or microscopic hematuria or red blood cells or hyaline casts that you will see in AHI and ATN. Also order lactate, super important for mesenteric ischemia. Your goal here is to lower the mean arterial pressure with 25% over one hour. So the hypertensive urgency was 25 to 30% decrease in MAP within two to four hours. But here, because it's emergent situation and the patient has symptoms, you have to lower the MAP with 25% over the first hour. And you do this with IV drip. There is no oral medication that can help you with that. The most commonly used IV medications are nicardipine, clavedipine and labetalol. Again, please remember, it is very important not to drop the blood pressure too much, too fast. Otherwise, you will precipitate ischemic complications like stroke, myocardial infarction and blindness. Now, let's go over here the IV medications that we have to treat hypertensive emergency. Number one is nicardipine, the so-called cardine drip. This is a continuous IV infusion. Nicardipine is a dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. As you remember, we have dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers and non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. The dipine drugs are the dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. They dilate, we use them in hypertension. Whereas the non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers like verapamil and dutiazem are used in uh, supraventricular tachycardias. Also, don't use nicardipine in acute heart failure and coronary artery disease. The next option is clavidipine. It's an again IV infusion. Clavidipine is an ultra short acting dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. It reduces the blood pressure without affecting the cardiac filling pressures but can cause reflex tachy. And clavidipine is contraindicated in patients with severe aortic stenosis because it increases the risk of severe hypotension. Another type of medications to treat hypertensive emergency are the beta blockers. Number one is the labetalol. It is preferred especially for CNS and cardiac and organ damage. Labetalol, as you remember, is a combined beta adrenergic and alpha adrenergic blocker. It has rapid onset of action, five minutes or less, and uh, makes it useful IV medications for our patient with hypertensive emergency. However, uh, trials have shown that nicardipine is slightly better than labetalol. So if you can choose between those two based on side effects, risk factors and contraindications, I would go with nicardipine first. Contraindications to labetalol, don't use them in patients with reactive airways like asthma, COPD, because again, labetalol is a mixed beta blocker. It has alpha 1, beta 1 and beta 2 blocking properties. So it will worsen a patient with asthma and COPD. Don't use it also in CHF, bradycardia, more than first degree AV block, few chromocytoma, cocaine and methamphetamine overdose. Labetalo can be given as multiple IV pushes or continued IV infusion in some hospitals. Then you can use also Esmolo. Esmolo effect begins almost immediately. It has both short half-life and short total duration of action. Half-life is 9 minutes and the duration of action is 30 minutes. You can titrate it rapidly, which is a good thing. But please don't use it in bradycardia or in patients with acute heart failure. Another beta blocker you can use is Metopro IV pushes. Again, don't use in bradycardia and acute heart failure. Other agents that you can use in hypertensive emergency are the hydralazine and enalaprilat. They are not first line choices. Hydralazine, as you know, is a direct arteriolar vasodilator with little or no effect on the venous circulation. The hypotensive uh, response with hydralazine is less predictable than the other medications. And uh, you will see that IV hydralazine is very commonly used 
in the hospital settings for this indication, hypertensive emergency. But if you can choose between hydralazine and nicardipine, please always choose nicardipine. The problem is with another prelat IV pushes is again unpredictable hypotensive response because the response depends upon the plasma volume and the plasma renin activity in individual patients. So that's why it's not preferred first line medication. Don't use it in pregnant people, severe renal artery stenosis and severe hyperkalemia and hydralazine, don't use it in patients with tachycardia. Okay, so we took care of the patients with the hypertensive urgency and the emergency. Now let's take care of the rest of the hypertensive patients. And first, let's define what is high blood pressure, what is normal pressure, so we can have a systemized plan in our heads to help us treat our patients. Also, please note that in order to diagnose someone with hypertension, you need to have two or more readings on two occasions for the outpatient management of high blood pressure. And here you can see these are the latest ACC and AHA BP guidelines. The previous JNC7 and the JNC8 that I'm sure you have heard of had different BP targets for different patient populations based on their age, comorbidities, etc. But the latest 2017 ACC AHA hypertension guidelines, after the SPRINT trial came to light, the BP ranges were changed and the blood pressure targets became uniform. And the BP goal is set to less than 130 over 80 for absolutely everyone. For more information, you can refer to my video on hypertension. Also, as we said before, let's repeat, it's always, always, always very important throughout patient who has elevated blood pressure for any other reason like pain, anxiety, alcohol withdrawal, psychiatric disturbances, because these are just hypertensive episodes. They don't necessarily need long-term treatment with antihypertensive therapy. Now, based on the latest guidelines, as we said, normal blood pressure is less than 120 over 80. Elevated blood pressure is systolic 120 to 129 and diastolic less than 180. And high blood pressure is divided into hypertension stage 1, which is systolic 130 to 139 and diastolic 80 to 89. And hypertension stage 2, which is systolic blood pressure 140 or higher and diastolic 90 or higher. Also, please know that some physicians think that BP around 140 over 90 is better for the elderly in view of stiff blood vessels and higher pressures that are required to push blood through the stiff blood vessels to deliver blood and oxygen to the vital organs, which obviously makes sense. But this theory is only a theory and haven't been, as of today, been supported by established hypertension guidelines. So another thing to keep in mind is that the guidelines are there to guide you. They are not obsolete. For example, I have seen patients who need optimal BP control but cannot tolerate such low blood pressure. When you drop the blood pressure to 120 over 80 in these patients, they feel dizzy, lethargic, weak, they cannot do their daily chores. So what do you do in this situation? You still treat to go BP or you try to balance between optimal BP and patient safety? You know, you see what I mean? Of course, you will prefer the patient safety. Okay, so now let's see what medications we can use to try to manage the high blood pressure. But before that, a quick clinical pearl before we jump into the management of hypertension. Here you can see that uh, I have put one EKG and um, as you know, the left ventricle hypertrophies in response to pressure overload, right? Secondary to conditions such as aortic stenosis and hypertension, which we can easily see with our favorite EKG. For further details, you can refer to my EKG lecture. Now, there are numerous voltage criteria for diagnosing left ventricular hypertrophy, but the most commonly used is the Sukhov criteria, which is the first one that you see on the slides. This is S wave depth in V1 plus the tallest R wave height in V5 or V6, more than 35 millimeters. On this EKG, as I have shown you here, one big box is 5 millimeters. If you count the height of the R wave in V5, it is almost five big boxes, so 5 times 5 millimeters is 25 millimeters. That is the R wave in V5, and then in V1, we have almost 
two and a half or let's say three big boxes, three times five is 15 millimeters, the S wave in V1. So 25 and 15 is 40 millimeters, which is more than 35 millimeters based on the Sukhov criteria. So this patient has left ventricular hypertrophy, probably from long-standing hypertension. Another criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy is the Cornell criteria. This is S in V3 plus R in AVL more than 25 millimeters in females and more than 28 millimeters in males. And the easiest criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy is the R wave in AVL more than 11 millimeters. The pathophysiology, for those of you who want to know behind these EKG changes, is because imagine that the thickened left ventricular wall leads to prolonged depolarization of the ventricle, right? Because it's so thick, it takes a long, longer time. So we, this will present on EKG with increased R wave peak time. And you will also see delayed repolarization of the left ventricle, again, because it's so thick, it takes a longer time, which you will see as ST and T wave abnormalities in the lateral leads. Let's review the general hypertension management guidelines as per the latest 2017 ACC AHA guidelines. Number one has always been, is, and will always be the non-pharmacological therapy, all right? So you need to put your patient on diet, they need to exercise, they need to lose weight and they should stop drinking. When you're about to start someone on antihypertensive therapy, you need to address the other medical problems that the patient might have. For example, some hypertensive patients have underlying conditions for which a specific antihypertensive drug might offer a particular benefit, right? Independent of the blood pressure control such as diotiazem or verapamil or beta blockers for rate control in AFib. Also, you have to consider the safety profile of your medication, side effects, contraindication, etc. But the main guidelines we have is for people all ages, non-black population, with or without the MNCKD, the first line of antihypertensive therapy is the ACE inhibitors and ARBs, then calcium channel blockers and the thiazide diuretics. Please remember then the ACE and ARPs are okay to be used in CKD with and without proteinuria in HFREF and post-MI, but do not use them in AKI, in bilateral renal atherosclerosis and in hyperkalemia. Then the next we have the African Americans with diabetes. Here the preferred drug are the thiazide diuretics or the calcium channel blockers, the dihydropyridines, which we again discussed earlier dihydropyridines dilate they are used in hypertension very important thing to remember is not to use the thiazide diuretics in hyperkalemia hyponatremia and gout also don't use the hydrochlorothiazide in gfr less than 30 if someone is using lithium already and they are glucose intolerant and for African Americans with CKD without proteinuria, the preferred drug is the calcium channel blockers, followed by the ACE and ARBs, and followed by thiazide diuretics. This is because the African Americans are apparently more responsive to dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers than to the ACE inhibitors, which doesn't mean that they will not benefit from ACE. But as first choice, you want to start in first on calcium channel blockers and then tailor your therapy further. So this is just a quick discussion for office therapy of high blood pressure, monotherapy versus combination therapy. So the general rule of thumb is that the patients with hypertension who are less than 20 over 10 above goal can initially be treated with monotherapy only. If these patients do not have any specific indication for a specific drug, the major drug classes that we can use for monotherapy are low-dose thiazide diuretics, long-acting ACE inhibitors or ARBs, and long-acting dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. But also keep in mind that uh, most of the time the combination therapy is between ACE, ARBs and dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. So it's a good idea to start uh, these patients on these drugs as monotherapy so you can add the next one after that. Also remember that uh, based on studies done, we know that ACE inhibitors and ARBs are more effective in younger patients 
whereas the dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers appear to be more effective in older adults and again in black patients. Combination therapy is reserved for patients with untreated office blood pressure, more than 20 over 10 above goal. Then we can start them on the combination therapy with long-acting ACE inhibitor or ARBs plus a long-acting dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. Some studies recommend uh, that for non-obese patients who are treated with ACE ARBs plus a thiazide diuretic and have attained the goal blood pressure, it's a good idea to stop the thiazide diuretic and switching them to long-acting dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. Whereas in obese patients, the combination ACE ARPS plus thiazide diuretic can be continued if this therapy has shown good response. And here's the fun uh, BP meds pearls that I wanted to share with you guys. Remember to always give the blood pressure medications time to work. It takes a few half-lives for medications to kick in. Don't just uh, add more medications in higher doses, just give them time to work. Also, please remember that 75% of the BP's drug lowering effect is achieved with a 50% of its maximum dose. So basically two drugs in moderate dose are better than one blood pressure medication in maximum dose. Please remember that. And also the combination BP meds have better compliance. As I have mentioned in the previous videos, the less medications administered fewer times a day will give you better compliance because patients are usually not compliant if the blood pressure medications has to be taken four times a day and they have multiple medications. So try to give combo medications to increase compliance. Also, when a patient comes with blood pressure that is not well controlled on antihypertensive, just consider secondary causes of hypertension, like drug-induced, most common drugs are NSAIDs, cocaine, OCPs, and steroids. Consider primary hyperaldosteronism. Consider renovascular disease, atherosclerotic or fibromuscular. Consider Cushing's disease, few homocytoma and sleep apnea, which are the most commonly seen cases of secondary causes of hypertension. Also be mindful of the PRESS syndrome. PRESS stands for posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. It can present with rapid onset of symptoms like headaches, seizures, confusion, visual disturbances. It is often, but by no means, always associated with acute hypertension. But since we are discussing hypertension, I thought to mention this syndrome here. If you promptly recognize it and you treat the patient, the symptoms resolve within a week. And the typical changes in the MRI brain resolve over days to weeks. So it's a very easily treatable condition if you know to look for it. We can't finish this video before giving you some beta blockers pearls to remember, which are high yield for the test and for your clinical practice. So we have three generations of beta blockers. The first generations are the non-selective beta blockers. They block beta-1 and beta-2 receptors. Here we have propranolol, timolol and pindolol. One way to remember is that the non-selective beta blockers start with the letters from O to Z. So blocking the beta-1 receptors obviously will affect the heart. As you can see on the right side, beta-1 receptors are found on the sinoatrial node, the AV node and the cardiac myocytes. So when you stimulate the beta-1 receptors, you will increase heart rate and contractility. Whereas when you block the beta-1 receptors, it will affect the heart rate, the conduction and the contractility of the heart while blocking the beta-2 receptors which are found on the blood vessels wall and on the smooth muscles you will cause smooth muscle contraction therefore bronchospasm in predisposed individuals so these drugs the non-selective beta blockers are not to be given in patients with reactive airways like asthma or copd also remember that apart from the cardiac effects, they can cause metabolic disturbances like hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia and hypertriglyceridemia. 
The second generations of beta blockers are the selective beta 1 blockers. One way to remember it is that the medications in this class start with letters from A to N, like atenolol, bisoprolol, esmolol, metoprolol, nadalol. Also, please note that uh, in low doses they block the beta-1 receptors, but they are capable of blocking beta-2 receptors in higher doses. But they are the preferred beta blockers in patients, as we said, with reactive airways and diabetes mellitus. Cardioselectivity also varies between the agents, with bisoprolol being the most selective one. The cool thing to remember is propranolol is uh, used as a first-line drug in management of essential tremor, portal hypertension, migraine prophylaxis and thyroid storm. Third generation beta blockers have vasodilatory properties. For example, we have mixed alpha-1 and beta-1 and beta-2 blockers, which are the carvedilol, which is guideline directed med medical therapy in HEFREF, it has mortality benefit. Also, we have labetalol here. As you can remember, we used it in hypertensive emergency and you can also use it in hypertension in pregnancy. By blocking the alpha-1 receptors on blood vessels, they will cause vasodilation because when stimulated alpha-1 receptors, as you can see here on the right side, when you stimulate alpha-1 receptors, you will cause vasoconstriction. But as these carvedilol and labetalol medications are alpha-1 blockers, they will cause the opposite, right? Vasodilation. We have here a medication Nebivolol, which causes nitric oxide release, which in turn causes vasodilation. And we have the cool ones Spindolol and Acebutalol, which have beta-2 intrinsic sympathomimetic activity and by stimulating and blocking adrenergic receptors tend to cause less bradycardia than the other beta blockers. And lastly, some calcium channel blocker pearls. As you know, these medications bind and block the alpha-type calcium channels, which are the predominant calcium channels in the myocardium and vascular smooth muscles. So by blocking the alpha-type calcium channels, they cause peripheral arterial vasodilation, which will cause drop in blood pressure, and they also cause myocardial depression, leading to negative chronotropic, inotropic and dromotropic effects. The main side effects, as you can anticipate here, are vasodilation in the forms of headaches and peripheral edema. And again, calcium channel blockers are classified into dihydropyridines and non-dihydropyridines. Dihydropyridines are the dipine drugs, nifedipine, amlodipine, they're potent vasodilators. We have the short-acting ones, nifedipine, clevedipine, nimodipine. We have intermediate acting nicardipine and the long acting amlodipine and felodipine. And the non dihydropyridine drugs like verapamil and diotiazem, they are potent myocardial depressants. They are also classified as class 4 antiarrhythmic drugs and are used in the treatment of supraventricular arrhythmias. So, this is the end of our video. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed making it. Have a great day everyone and see you on the next video.